Hey guys, so in the spirit of Halloween, I know this is the day after, but we thought we'd compile a video of short, scary, spooky stories for you. Hope everyone had a good Halloween. Spooktober. <laughs> I, 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 I feel like I've been hungover for two I know, days. Honestly. To be honest with you, that was, a, that was a heavy session at Lincoln. That was a heavy, heavy day. Yeah. <laughs> I can't okay. really speak Anyway, let's now. get into this story yeah. while I, you guys enjoy. Charlie Noonan's last interview. Charlie Noonan was an amateur folklorist who travelled through the South and Southwestern United States during the early years of the 20th century, collecting tall tales and stories of the supernatural. According to his wife, Ellie, Charlie was told a story one day by an Oklahoma farmer about a strange woman who lived alone on an isolated property in the Panhandle. The farmer claimed the woman was not a woman at all, but something else. Something that hid its true nature beneath the headscarf and was never seen without a large dog by its side. Noonan was apparently intrigued enough to try searching for the woman during one of his research road trips. He was never seen again. Ellie Noonan was later contacted by a Tulsa pawnbroker who remembered reading about her husband's disappearance in the papers after finding his name engraved on a camera sold to him by an itinerant. The pawnbroker returned the camera and Miss Noonan had the film inside developed in hopes of finding a clue as to his whereabouts. This was the only photo on the roll. Unfortunately, Neither the location of the property, nor the name of the farmer who told him the story, was recorded in Noonan's notes. We strongly encourage the people in these pictures to make contact with us so we can have a chat about their recent activities around Parnell and in the domain. If you or your friends know who they are, drop a text to Detective Peter Mortimer on this number, or call 111 if you see them in your travels. It appears these two people are carrying firearms of some sort, which, aside from being incredibly scary for people who encounter them, is incredibly dangerous for the masked individuals themselves. When police are notified of people carrying and displaying weapons in public, we respond with armed officers. We have no way of knowing until we seize a weapon, whether it's real or imitation, so we always treat it as real. Wise up, drop the mask act and come and chat with us about how to play safely. 19th of January 2003. Indian officials ventured into deep jungle, investigating several missing person reports from a nearby city. What they found was a Tower of Silence, or Dakma. Zoroastrians use these sites to dispose of bodies in the open air. While sites like these are not uncommon in certain parts of India, several peculiarities hint at something more unusual. 1. None of the bodies depicted in the photograph were identified. Villagers from nearby who were initially surprised at the sheer number of corpses in the Dakma proved unable to recognise the bodies. The corpses also do not match the descriptions of the missing people. 2. There were no animals except for maggots and flies. Zoroastrians rely on birds such as buzzards to dispose of the bodies in the belief they are contributing back to the earth. Officials find the corpses relatively untouched by any sort of animal. 3. There is no official count of the bodies. In fact, little work was actually accomplished at the site. And perhaps this is the reason only one photograph has emerged. Officials avoided the spot, not only because they felt uneasy looking at it, but for the following as well. 4. The deep pit in the centre of the photograph was filled with several feet of festering blood, far more than the bodies on the outside could ever supply. The stench was so unbearable, many of the officials began to get nauseous when they first approached the Dakma. The expedition was ended when a villager accidentally kicked a small bone into the pit, penetrating the congelated surface of the pool. A massive burst of gas from the decomposing blood erupted from the pit, splashing those looking India, along with the photographer. Those caught in the explosion were immediately sent to the hospital, where they were quarantined for possible infection. They became delirious with fever, shouting about being tainted with the blood of a Raymond. The personification of evil in Zoroastrianism. Despite never having admitted they had any familiarity with the religion, in fact many of them had no idea what the Dakma was, even when they had found it. Delirium turned to insanity, as many began to attack hospital staff until they were sedated. The fever eventually killed all of them. When officials returned with hazmat gear the following day, the site was empty. All the bodies had been removed and astonishingly, the pool of blood in the pit had even been drained. All that remained of the incident was this photograph. The Grand Caverns Cryptids This photo was taken in 1895 by an amateur spelunker slash photographer named Oren Jeffries while exploring an unmapped section of Grand Caverns in southwestern Virginia. At the time it was taken, 
Jeffries was conducting photographic experiments using super long exposures to see if anything at all could be captured in the total absence of light, otherwise known as cave darkness. He would situate himself on level ground, extinguish his lantern, and then open the lens of his homemade box camera for as long as he could stand the darkness. During one of these experiments, he heard something approach from the deeper recesses of the cave. Frightened, Jeffries abandoned his experiment and set off one of the Blitzlitz flashes he used for taking traditional photos underground. According to the report he later gave to a local newspaper, Jeffries saw three humanoid creatures staring at him from the shadows and took off running in the other direction and didn't stop running until he was topside. Several days later he returned with three other men to retrieve his box camera. This is the image that was recorded on the film side. The Axeman of New Orleans Edouard Martel was an unsuccessful French photographer and inventor who travelled throughout the US during the first two decades of the 20th century, trying to drum up interest in investors for a device that added a timer and automatic exposure features to Kodak's popular line of folding brownie cameras. During his travels, he took thousands of automated photos to test and refine his invention. Often he would wake up early, set up a hidden camera in an inconspicuous spot on the street of whatever city he happened to be in, and then walk to a nearby cafe or bar so that he could capture candid scenes of daily life to remember his travels by. The best of these photos were selected for Mattel's one and only gallery show in Paris, 1924. Unfortunately, Mattel died penniless and unknown in 1955, and it was left to his daughter Jean to sort through the boxes and boxes of photos he left behind to see what should be kept and what should be discarded. During this process, she came across this photo, taken in New Orleans on the morning of October 28th, 1919, a few hours before Martel boarded his steamer ship and returned to France. It turns out that Martel hated motion blurs in his photographs because he thought they would reflect badly on the speed and accuracy of his lens mechanism. This prejudice made him cast aside and overlook what was possibly the most important photo he ever took. What makes this photo so special? The night before it was taken, the notorious and still unidentified serial killer known only as the Axeman of New Orleans had committed his last murder, hacking Mike Pepitone to death in his bedroom and then fleeing the scene just as Pepitone's wife was discovering the body. Could this be him returning to his residence? It's impossible to say, but if it is, the image appears to belie the legend based on the shaky testimony of Pauline and Mary Bruno and prevailing prejudice of the time, that only a black man was capable of such savagery. Kittens were a handful. I knew that beforehand, before adopting the little guy that I have now, but I didn't fully grasp just how much attention they needed. Growing up, we'd always have adult cats, or at least I never remembered the periods when they were younger. We always seemed to have one or two around, however I suppose that's why I made the decision to adopt one when I moved into my own place. It didn't feel right not to have one of the demanding fuzzballs running around my feet or claiming my pillows when I wanted to go to bed. He was named Boo, although the name wasn't my choice. Boo was the offspring of an alley cat which had been taken to the local shelter when the mother cat was found at a murder scene. Some guy recently released from rehab or prison or something, found between two apartment buildings and shoved behind the dumpster they both shared. Boo's mother was nibbling on the guy's face or toe or something of the sort when the police showed up after the mother died in birth, an event that only Boo survived among the entire litter. He'd been graciously taken in by a foster family until he was old enough to be adopted out. They were the ones who chose the name. Fitting, I suppose, given how much he likes jumping out of nowhere and scaring the shit out of me from time to time. Even my dog, an older member of my family that I had since high school isn't safe from Boo's pranks. The poor dog can never get a moment's rest and avoids Boo when he can. The two don't really get along, but I suppose with Oreo's age, he isn't likely to get along with such an energetic little furball. It's a good thing that other things catch the little guy's attention, like the couch pillows, the curtains, and whatever bug flies or crawls too close. It's this that I think about as I make my way home after an early shift at work. Boo always seemed to be following something with his eyes playfully batting at it or jumping into the air to snap it with his mouth. I found a number of spiders and moths on the foot of my bed from these antics. Once or twice there was even a small bird, though I don't know how he would have managed to catch any of those. He's not able to get outside. No matter how disgusted or upset I am with his gifts, 
However, he always responds with a cute little stretch and a tilt upwards of the head, seeming rather proud of himself. Sometimes it even seems like he's smiling at me. And while waking up to a bed full of bugs isn't all that great, I can't stay mad at him for long. As I unlock my apartment door and step through, I decide I should buy him a new toy. The last few are already torn to shreds and it won't be long before he decides to drag his claws through the curtains again. But the first thing on my schedule is a nap. It's been quite a while since I've been up this early, let alone working hard labour while I'm at it. And I'm utterly exhausted. A few hours of rest won't hurt. I head straight to my bedroom, kicking off my shoes at the door and throwing my jacket on the back of the couch as I pass through. I barely step through my room's door when a cold stone drops in my stomach and it feels like my lungs have been momentarily deflated. A split second later, my eyes fall onto the black and white mass of my dog at the foot of my bed. His shaggy hair is torn out in patches and in a disarray, his body still and his back twisted in an unnatural way. Not a moment after, Boo jumps up on my bed from the side opposite of me and I jump even more than I usually would have. It's enough to pull me out of my shock and finally take a deep, shaky breath. There's already a pressure building up between my eyes and a lump forming in my throat. Boo arches his back, pushing up onto his toes. He sits down, tail waving lazily and head tilted back, seeming rather proud of himself. It even seems like he's smiling at me. Little fuck. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed that. Um, I know the last one was a bit more lighthearted than the other ones, yeah. but I kind of felt fucking like I needed... Little smile. <laughs> that little fucking smile. I know, I just got the photo with it. I was like, you know what, it's going in. I don't care. You know, um, I really enjoy all them ones, though. I've came across them before, and see anything but photos, I think photos just add an they extra... They add it, they make it. They make an they extra do. layer of, like, spooky dits. Mm-hmm. And if you can make it real at the same time, then that's ideal, yeah. you know? Yeah, But also... Megan's actually got her own channel. Uh, we're going to be getting back onto that very soon, where it's going to be focusing on paranormal X board stories. Spooky stories. You know, so if you like well, spook, get on over, press check subscribe, check the notification bell. And we'll probably be doing the kick off the channel again. We'll probably be doing like a part series. So, like, the first part here. And yeah. then the next part on my channel to bring these over so you know what you're going to get. Yeah, I think, well, you'll see, you'll see. But we're, it's just been one of those ones, um, it's to do with time and stuff. And we just haven't been able to work on the channel as but much as we would it's like. It's coming, it's coming. It's coming soon, so I hope you guys enjoy. Um, if you enjoy this sort of stuff, you know, you'll enjoy the stuff over there. Yeah. Anyway, I hope you guys have a, had a good Halloween because... I can't remember. I can't remember <laughs> my Halloween, to be honest with you. I can't remember it at all. But anyway, I hope you guys enjoy and we'll see you next time. Bye. Gods have chosen their champions to battle to the death. Luckily, they can resurrect them to fight and die again and again. In this fast-paced, hard-hitting fighting game, reading your opponent is as important as rolling your dice. Use different attacks and abilities, cut through your opponent, or drive them into a wall of spikes. Pit Fighter features easy rules with gorgeous miniatures suitable for any tabletop skirmish, RPG, or war game. Each battle takes only one to five minutes, perfect for a group of friends with some downtime on game night or when someone has to pause to take a call.